A few years before the first iPhone was revealed, Steve Jobs sat down with a Microsoft executive who was convinced they had the next big thing. This Microsoft exec proudly unveiled to Steve an all-screen tablet device that would revolutionize the world. Now, Steve had a bit of a history with this guy. You see, this executive had a particular knack for really getting under Steve's skin. This meeting was yet another attempt to show off to Steve how much better Microsoft was compared to Apple. But this particular time, things were different. You see, unknown to Microsoft, the reveal of the secret all-screen device ultimately gave Steve the missing piece he needed to create one of the biggest inventions of the 21st century, the iPhone. But the troubled and messy story of how Steve actually got there is probably not what you think and actually goes even further back. This is the fascinating story of why and how the iPhone was created. Apple had plans to create a phone as far back as the 80s. During this time, early concepts for phones, tablets, earbuds, and laptops bounced all around Apple. Oddly enough though, the first mobile phone Apple worked on actually resembled an Apple. Patents for this device were filed in 1982, and that's how we know about it. The device featured a simple mobile phone built inside of a plastic shell that resembled a 3D version of the Apple logo. Sadly, nothing ever became of this device, but dang, would this have been a really Really cool collector's item. Honestly, a lot of these prototypes from this era seem really cool, and it makes me wonder, what kinds of prototypes are they cooking up today? Everything changed though in 2000, when mobile phones became increasingly popular. It was around this time Steve knew that Apple needed to get into the mobile phone market, but at the time, Apple lacked the proper knowledge needed to do so, and allegedly Steve also hated mobile phones in general and just felt the technology was incredibly clunky. At the same time, Steve knew Apple needed to expand beyond personal computers, and this is when the iPod was born. As many of us know, the iPod became the best-selling MP3 player of all time and accounted for nearly 50% of Apple's revenue. Still though, Steve Jobs knew that the holy grail was a mobile phone, so they began work on developing the iPod into a phone. This was the start of Project Purple. Early prototypes for the device used the same design language as the iPod, including the famous click wheel. At the time, Apple simply wanted to add phone features to the iPod, but the biggest issues they found was with text messaging. You see, with the iPod design, users would have to scroll through an alphabet and select each letter and number one at a time. Honestly, it was like dialing on a rotary phone. People in the comments are gonna be like, you're too young to know about that. Still though, there was an even bigger problem that Steve was worried about. Steve knew that eventually they could solve the hardware and software issues, but no cell phone carriers at the time would give away all their control to another company. Apple wanted full control over everything. All they really needed was a network that could support calls, texting, and the internet. Steve knew that this was going to be an uphill battle, and he was going to need the help of one of the largest phone manufacturers in the world, Motorola. During this time, Motorola had just gone through a massive shakeup as the company was actively losing market share to other phone manufacturers. Motorola needed new blood and new ideas. So Ed Zander, who Steve knew from back in the day, took over as CEO and soon released the highly popular Razer phone. I remember when the Razer phone came out, like all the cool kids at my school had Razer phones. I never had one though. I was not a cool kid. I'm sure there's gonna be at least one comment talking about that. Because of the Razer success, Motorola quickly gained their status in the market. And this caught the eye of Steve Jobs. Xander and Jobs had many closed door meetings about developing some sort of partnership together. Of course, Jobs was highly interested in the popular Razer phone and had an ingenious idea to take their iTunes application and put it on the Razer. Now, secretly, this was part of a bigger plan that Steve had to actually boost the iPod sales, as Steve was going to put a worse version of iTunes on the phone so people would see the feature and think it was cool but then just want an iPod instead. Of course, Xander didn't know about any of that, but he was highly protective of their flagship Razer phone and he didn't feel it was the right product for this partnership. Instead, Xander proposed that they create a new phone from scratch and Jobs reluctantly agreed to the idea. 
At the same time, Motorola suggested that they find a phone carrier to partner with who would agree to sell the phone. This is when Apple was introduced to Singular Wireless, who'd later be known as AT&T. Little did Xander know that this introduction was actually going to cause a lot of issues later on. We'll get to that in a second. As we know now, Apple rarely ever announces a product before they're ready to reveal it. Soon after this meeting, Apple and Motorola announced to the world that they were forming a partnership together and adding iTunes to a new generation of phones. However, no such phone had actually been invented yet, which again, was not ideal for Steve. Still, this announcement was great for Apple stock as everyone anticipated these new phones. For a while, Apple and Motorola's partnership seemed to be going really well on the surface. That is, until the CEO of Motorola decided to prematurely demo their new iTunes phone at the CES conference. Steve was furious as Xander showed off an early production model that was not finished, not ready, and had many issues that needed to be resolved. So what actually happened to the iTunes phone? The iTunes phone, actually called the Rocker E1, debuted on September 7th, 2005. It featured a built-in camera, stereo speakers, which was unusual at the time, and included stereo headphones as well to really sell the MP3 player part of the phone. Motorola and Apple both had separate press launches announcing the new product, and the past year of work was finally about to pay off. That is until Steve completely overshadowed the phone and announced another product at the same event, the iPod Nano. Of course, nobody actually knows if this was intentionally done to kill off the sales of the Roker phone, but it was clear at this point that Steve was really unhappy with the phone and Apple wanted you to buy the iPod instead. So the Rocker E1 or the iTunes phone was an instant failure. After this, the rift between Apple and Motorola continued to grow. The CEO was furious Steve had now undermined their new partnership and new product and had this to say about the new iPod Nano. Screw the Nano. Who listens to a thousand songs? People are going to want devices that do more than just play music. In some ways, he was right that people will want a device that can do more than just play music, but at the same time, the revolution of the iPod Nano was just too good to pass up. As this divide between the two companies began to grow, Steve Jobs was having secret meetings with one of Motorola's carriers behind their back. Before the iTunes phone had even come out, Steve began meeting with Singular Wireless, or AT&T, to negotiate his own deals. Without any product or prototype in hand, Steve approached Singular with an idea for a new phone, a phone made completely by Apple, a phone that would be more revolutionary than the iMac and the iPod, something that nobody had seen before. Steve promised Singular they would have exclusive rights to the phone, but in return, he wanted Apple to become sort of an operator of its own. Apple would control the OS and the apps, and Singular would control the network. Of course, there were two big problems with this. As mentioned earlier, no cell carrier at the time wanted to give up that kind of control. I mean, after all, at the time, carriers were charging $3 for just a ringtone. So there was no way they were going to allow Apple that much freedom. Second, Apple didn't even have any sort of prototype to show. You have to admire Steve's ambition because he went into this meeting with basically nothing to give. And although he didn't really convince Singular, at the meeting, they also didn't exactly say no to him either, which then gave Steve the confidence to continue working on an Apple phone. Throughout the next year or so, as Apple was working on their phone, Steve continued to pursue a mobile carrier. Steve also met with other companies like Verizon Wireless as well, but they basically laughed in his face at his idea and just were not interested. However, sometime in 2006, Singular was working on expanding their coverage on non-call related services. Essentially, they recognized a desire in the market for access to the internet. And slowly over time, Singular became more and more open to the idea of working with Apple on their new phone because a major selling point of the device, of course, was going to be access to the internet. Singular ultimately agreed to a five-year contract, meaning the largest carrier in the United States 
bought a product it had never seen. I mean, how insane is that? <laughs> that just shows how good Steve was at persuading people. Of course, now the issue is, what about the phone? At this point at Apple, they had two competing designs for a phone. On one hand, you had the original Project Purple idea based on the iPod. On the other side, you had a new Project Purple 2, which was more radical and used the multi-touch displays Apple had been working on for their tablets. You know, those same tablets that Jobs got the idea from, from Microsoft. This is what led to the development of Project Purple 2 using a multi-touch display. Well, the decision was to split the project into two teams, with one working on the iPod design and one working on the touchscreen design. But this not only split up the two teams, it also created a massive rift in the company. Eventually, the executives who oversaw the projects could not even sit in the same room together, with one quitting and one even getting fired. Ultimately though, it was clear to Steve that the more exciting project was Purple 2. This was a big turning point, as now, the phone project had a clear direction. It would be a touch-first approach, something nobody else was doing. Because Steve was so worried about the competition, Apple created a secret team within the company to work on this project. Soon, employees all around the company started disappearing, as upper management secretly plucked Apple's best engineers and designers to go work on Project Purple 2. These engineers and designers began debating over the hardware and operating system the phone would use. Some wanted the simpler Linux operating system, which was currently used on the iPod. And honestly, it was just faster and easier to implement because they already knew how to do it. But ultimately, the engineers decided to adapt Mac OS X to the phone, as they sort of viewed the phone more like a computer than an iPod. Still, with the clock ticking, Steve knew they needed to speed up development. So again, two teams were created. I guess Steve had a thing for dividing teams into two or something, because the more I look into Apple, the more this seems like it's kind of a theme with him. <laughs> Now, one team would work on the hardware, or the phone itself, while the other team would work on adapting Mac OS X to the phone. In the fall of 2006, the Purple 2 team gathered in a windowless room to show off the very first prototype. Unfortunately, nothing on the prototype worked, and with only a year out from the announcement, Steve and the team were incredibly worried they sunk themselves into a project that they couldn't get themselves out of. The next year, turned into the most grueling and intense years at Apple Engineering. Andy Grignon, a senior iPhone engineer, told The Verge, The iPhone is the reason I'm divorced. It was really intense, probably professionally one of the worst times of my life, because you created a pressure cooker of a bunch of really smart people with an impossible deadline, an impossible mission, and then you hear that the future of the entire company is resting on it. The big problem was that during this project, Apple lacked a lot of the expertise when it came to making an actual phone. While they had software and computer engineers and designers, they lacked the proper ways to actually test the phone capabilities, which actually led to major problems with dropped calls and reliability. The team had been so caught up in making the phone a computer that they forgot to prioritize one of the most important features, being a phone. To solve these issues, engineers basically had to sleep at Apple Labs for months and months and months until they could figure out the solutions to these problems. Finally, a working device was shown to Singular Wireless, who at this time was now known as AT&T, only weeks before Steve Jobs announced it to the world. At the time, the phone was still facing issues with reliability, and it would often crash if you tried to do too many things at once. Still. Jobs had a deadline to make, and regardless of the state of the phone, they had to reveal it to the world in January. This meant that they had to be a little sneaky with their grand reveal. On January 9th, 2007, wearing his trademark black turtleneck and blue jeans, Steve Jobs walked onto stage and revealed the very first iPhone to the world. Though the device that Steve actually took onto the stage was an incomplete prototype. For example, it could play a selection of a song or video, but apparently would crash if a user tried to play the entire clip. Also, 
the apps that were demonstrated at the keynote were not actually finished and still had many bugs. And there is also no guarantee that they would not crash during the demonstrations. Because of this, Apple actually had multiple iPhone prototypes up on stage, each prepared for a specific part of the presentation. As Steve would demonstrate a feature or an app, he would need to carefully select the right iPhone, which was set up to only do that task. Now, engineers watched backstage with intense anxiety, I'm sure you can imagine, hoping that the presentation would go smoothly. When the finale came and everything worked seamlessly, the entire team celebrated by spending the rest of the day drinking. Apparently, it was a mess, but after the year they had building this phone, I think it's safe to say they deserve to have some fun. The original iPhone hit stores on June 29th, 2007, with a price tag of $499, and AT&T being the exclusive carrier for the phone. In its debut year, the original iPhone managed to move just over 6 million units. While sales of today's iPhones blow that number out of the water, the first iPhone still holds a special place in Apple's history as one of the most iconic products.